guys in. Uh, today, we're going to finish chapter five by talking about halving the identities. So we'll go through, at the beginning, we'll go through how we derive them. Um, it'll be a lot quicker than some of the other ones we've derived. And, <clears throat> and then we'll talk about using them to find exact values for certain uh, for, for certain angles that we don't necessarily know offhand normally. And then we'll talk about using them in identities as well. So first things first, um, since we talked about the, <coughs> the double angle identities and things like that, we'll go ahead and use those to help us find the half angle identities. This one says some identities, but I mean, it's also the double angles. So we have that cosine of 2x is 1 minus 2 sine squared of x. Might as well mention that because, you know, we'll need to know that for the test, for everything else. That's our double angle identity for cosine in terms of sine. If we just solve that for sine of x. So add 2 sine squared to both sides, subtract cosine of 2x from both sides, and then... I divide everything by two and take the square root of both sides. All right, so I'm gonna have one minus cosine of two X over two, take the square root. Remember that means I'm gonna have plus or minus the square root of one minus cosine of two X all over two. <coughs> and then if we replace that two X part with just an angle that we call A, that means that the angle X that we have as part of sine of X is that angle A over two. And this is where the half angle part comes in. We're taking half of angle A, so sine of A over two is gonna be equal to plus or minus the square root of one minus cosine of the angle A all divided by two. All right, so this is where we get again, Based on the normal angle, we get the, the sine of the half angle in this case. And that's our identity for, that's our half angle identity for sine. Cosine, very, very similar. I mean, this, I should, yeah, should mention that the plus or minus sign is going to depend on which quadrant we're in. For this one, unlike with double angle identities, for this one, we'll automatically know. If I know where A is, then I definitely know where A over 2 is. All right? We'll be able to tell based on whatever quadrant A is in which one A over 2 is. Not, we couldn't tell that if we were talking about the double angles because, you know, we could double it. We could end up in multiple different quadrants. But half angles, we can, abs we can absolutely tell <coughs> where it's going to be. So we'll pick the right side. Right? For cosine, and to get the half angle identity for that, we're going to use the double angle identity again. We're just going to use the other definition of it for cosine. So say that cosine of 2x, 2 cosine squared of x minus 1 instead of 1 minus 2 sine squared of x. And then solve for cosine of x the same way or similar way that we solved for sine of x just a second ago. So I'm going to add one to both sides. I'm going to divide both sides by two. And then I'm going to take the square root. So I'm going to have that cosine of x plus or minus the square root of one plus cosine of two x over two. And then we're just going to replace again. We're going to replace that two x with an angle A. Just call whatever the angle that's inside of here. Just call it an angle A. And that means that the angle X on the other side is A over 2. It's the half angle that we're talking about. So why do you, why do you add the 1? You need just from the B. Yeah, we're just solving for cosine of X from that beginning part. So add 1 to both sides, divide it by 2, and then take the square root. What does that do? Does that take the 2X out? It, it allows us to replace the 2X with just an angle A so that on the other side that we have this half angle A over 2. All right. And again, sine depends on whichever quadrant A over two is gonna be in. So 
positive if it's cosine, positive if it's in the first or fourth quadrant, negative if it's in the second or third. Those are our half angle identities for sine and cosine. Very, very, very similar, mostly because we're actually using the, the double angle identity for cosine in both cases. But cosine of a over two plus or minus the square root of one plus cosine of a all over two. Sine of a over two plus or minus square root of one minus uh, cosine of a over two. The only difference between the sine and cosine half angle identities is the plus or minus sign inside the square root there. All right, for tangent, we can find this a few different ways. So I'm looking for the half angle identity for tangent, finding tangent of A over two. Obviously, simplest thing that we can do is use the two definitions that we just found, <clears throat> the two identities that we just found. Say sine of A over two, over cosine of a over two and use plus or minus the square root one minus cosine of a all divided by two and then over plus or minus square root of one plus cosine of a all over two all right if i do that since they're both inside the square root i can take the square root of the whole thing the twos are going to cancel out i'm just left with a plus or minus square root of one minus cosine of a over one plus cosine of a, right? So that's one definition for the half angle for tangent. All right, that one still has a, a square root in it, which isn't always the most useful, or let's say sometimes that, that makes things a little more complicated. We can get rid of it if we can have an identity without it. That's typically more helpful. So I can also use some double angle identities to, to rewrite tangent of A over two. So I'm still gonna say, start with sine of A over two over cosine of A over two. Same thing that we did a second ago. But instead of using the half angle identities for that, I'm gonna multiply the top and the bottom both by two cosine of A over two And the reason we do that is so that on the top, two sine of an angle, cosine of that same angle, that looks like our double angle identity for sine. All right, two sine theta, cosine theta was just the same as sine of two theta. That was our identity, our double angle identity for sine. So two sine of A over two, cosine of A over two is just sine of two times that angle, A over two. Right. And then similarly, we actually used this a second ago. It doesn't look like the exact form, but if I have two cosine squared of A over two, that's still part of um, our double angle identity for cosine. It's just a different part than we're used to. I have cosine of two X is two cosine squared of X minus one. Well, that means two cosine squared of an angle is just cosine of two times that angle plus one. All right. And so that's the reason we're writing it this way. That's the reason I'm multiplying the top and bottom by two cosine of A over two here is so that I can use those double angle identities, rewrite this and notice sine of two times A over two is just sine of A cosine of two times A over two is just cosine of A. So I'm left with a half angle identity for tangent that actually doesn't have those, that radical in it, it doesn't have the square root in it. It's just sine of A over one plus cosine of A. All right. And then I can also rewrite that in a little bit different way. If I were to multiply, if I were to multiply the top and the bottom by one minus cosine of A, in a similar way, I, we, we talked about this when we were talking about verifying identities and things like that. Um, multiplying by that conjugate so that I can rewrite it and use the Pythagorean theorem. If I do that, I can also rewrite tangent of A over two as one minus cosine of A over sine of A. All right. 
So go through that. In fact, maybe as an exercise, verify that using that conjugate, multiplying the top and the bottom by one minus cosine of A will actually give us this identity. All right. But having said that, here's our, <coughs> here are our identities, our half angle identities for sine, cosine, and the three that we have for tangent, the three different forms. All right. So cosine of A over two plus or minus square root of one plus cosine of A all divided by two. Sine of A over two plus or minus the square root of one minus cosine of A all divided by two. And then for tangent of A over two, those three different forms, the one that has the radical that kind of combines the first two, so plus or minus the square root of one minus cosine of A over one plus cosine of A, or, and again, a lot of times, a lot of times easier for us, especially if we're talking about verifying identities, since they don't have that square root in them. Tangent of A over two is either sine of A over one plus cosine of A, or one minus cosine of A over sine of A. If we remember this one right here, these two, at least the order that they're in, are a little easier to remember. I have the one plus cosine of A in the denominator here, just like I have in that form. All right, it's in the denominator underneath the radical, but same idea, and the sine of A is on top. This other form, the one minus cosine of A is in the numerator, just like it is there. Um, again, it's underneath the radical in the first one, but they stay in the same place. And so we can at least, if we remember one of those, remember that first one, we'll make sure we can get the order right for, or at least the sign correct, the one plus or the one minus in any of those cases. All right. All right, let's use a couple of these. Let's say I want to find the exact value of cosine of 15 degrees using the half angle identity instead of, say, the sum or difference identity, which we have done before. So before, if I was finding cosine of 15 degrees, I could have said it's cosine of 45 degrees minus 30 degrees. We use the difference identity for cosine, found it that way. Right? I can find the exact value because, again, we know those special trig angles for 45 and 30. If I'm looking for cosine of 15 degrees, I can also say <clears throat> that's just half of 30 degrees, right? So cosine of one half times 30 degrees means I can use a half angle identity. It means that in this case, A is 30 degrees. So in this identity over here, we have at the top, I have one half times 30, so I'm going to have plus or minus the square root of one plus cosine of 30 degrees over two, right? It's going to be positive because 15 degrees is in the first quadrant, cosine positive there. But we can find this exact value because, again, we know 30 degrees is a special trig angle. So I know what cosine of 30 degrees is. It is square root of three over two. <coughs> so I'm gonna have one plus square root of three over two, all divided by two, and then all of that underneath the square root. I wanna simplify that a little bit. We're still gonna end up with a form that is a little weird looking because we're gonna have a, a square root inside of a square root but I can simplify that a little bit at least by dividing the one by two and dividing the square root of three over two by two. I get the square root of one half plus the square root of three over four. And then I can get a common denominator between those two fractions. So if I have one half and square root of three over four, the common denominator is just going to be four. So it's going to be two over four plus square root of three over four. And if I get that common denominator and combine them together, that means I'm going to have overall inside that square root, two plus the square root of three over four. 
which I can simplify. I can take the square root of the top and the square root of the bottom separately since I'm dividing them. So I'm gonna have the square root of two plus the square root of three and then divided by the square root of four, which is just two. Right. So it's another exact value. <coughs> it looks a little bit different than the way that it'd be written if we were using the difference formula. Remember that cosine of 45 degrees minus 30 degrees. That's not going to have, that, that did not have a square root inside of a square root. Instead, it was like the square root of 6 plus square root of 3 over 2 or something like that, over 4, actually. But different way of writing it, still an exact value because we're not estimating it by figuring out what the decimal form of those square roots are. And again, it's a weird looking form, but using these half angle identities, we're probably going to end up with that because I'm going to have the cosine underneath the radical, cosine of 30 degrees, cosine of 45 degrees, cosine of 60 degrees, whatever it is. <coughs> uh, sometimes that might work out, cosine of 60 is one half, I won't have that extra square root underneath the other square root. But if we do, we'll just leave it in that form. All right. So how would you work that out there? What is it? Uh, there's not a good way. There's not a good way to change it. Put a reciprocal or that. Yeah, I mean, the problem with trying to, to get this out of the square root would mean I'd have to multiply the top by the square root of two plus square root of three, and that means I also have to multiply the bottom, so then it's not a, in a rationalized form. There really just isn't a good way. It's It just looks weird, and it's going to look weird as a final answer. All right. Let's say I want to find tangent of 22 and a half degrees. We'll use the specific identity, at least in this case, tangent of A over 2 is sine of A over 1 minus, or sorry, 1 plus cosine of A. I could use any of the three, if you're finding it, any of those three possible identities, half angle identities for tangent. We'll use this one specifically so we get the form that we're looking for. Right? But tangent of 22 and a half degrees is tangent of 45 degrees over 2. We recognize that that's half of an, a, one of those special trig angles that we know, 45, 45 degrees. Then I can use that trig identity, that half angle identity for tangent. A in this case will be 45 degrees, so I'm going to have sine of 45 over 1 plus cosine of 45. And sine of 45 and cosine of 45 degrees are both square root of 2 over 2. Not a form that we would prefer to have. One, the denominator is not rationalized. There's still a square root down there. But also there's fractions inside of fractions, and that's never really a good thing. So if I multiply first, to simplify this, if I multiply the top and the bottom by 2, just so that I can get rid of the, the fractions in the numerator and the denominator to cancel them out. Obviously, that cancels with the two here and there. Two times one is two. So I'm going to end up with the square root of two over two plus the square root of two. And then I still have that square root of two in the denominator, so I need to rationalize that. Since it's being added to two here, that means I need to multiply by the conjugate. So I'm going to multiply both the top and the bottom by 2 minus the square root of 2. All right. The reason we do that, again, a plus b times a minus b is just a squared minus b squared. All right. The middle terms, if I FOIL that out, you know, a squared and then plus 2 squared of 2 minus 2 squared of 2. They cancel out. It's the whole point of doing it um, in this case. 
So on the top, don't forget to multiply the numerator by that, multiply this out. I'm going to have 2 times the square root of 2 minus the square root of 2 times the square root of 2, which is just 2. <coughs> and then on the bottom, I have, again, a squared minus b squared. So 2 squared minus the square root of 2 squared. So 4 minus 2 in this case. All right. On the top, I can actually factor out a 2, which I want to do because on the bottom, I'm just left with 2. 4 minus 2 is just going to give me 2 on the bottom. So I have 2 times square root of 2 minus 1, all divided by 2. Cancel the 2s. I just have the square root of 2 minus 1 as my final answer. Probably could make this easier, although I do like this just as an example of continuing to make sure we understand the algebra behind this and rationalizing denominators and simplifying, uh, just simplifying in general. Probably could have made this easier on ourselves by using the half angle identity for tangent that is one minus cosine of A over sine of A, because then I don't have to worry about you know, multiplying the denominator by the, the conjugate and things like that, I would still end up, I would still end up having to multiply both the top and the bottom by two, and then also by the square root of two, but we could still, it'd be a little bit easier. Which formula is that? Huh? Which formula did you say you could resolve it? Probably this one right here. Okay. Because I'd have one minus square root of two over two, divided by the square root of 2 over 2. And then, I, again, I'd still multiply by 2 over 2. That's 2 minus the square root of 2 over the square root of 2, and then multiply by square root of 2 over square root of 2 and cancel stuff out. But I wouldn't end up having to multiply by the conjugate like this. It'd be a little bit simpler. Not, not a whole lot simpler, but a little bit simpler to get to that final answer. All right. Right. Let's say if I know that cosine of S is two thirds and that S is in the fourth quadrant, so between three pi over two and two pi, find the half angles S over two for cosine, sine, and tangent. First thing to note here, and we kind of talked about this with the identities themselves. I actually can tell which quadrant S over two is gonna be in if I know where S is. So if I said, if I know that S is between three pi over two and two pi, I know that S over two, I'm just gonna divide, <clears throat> I'm gonna divide both of those terms or really all three of those terms by two. So S over 2 is going to be <clears throat> between 3 pi over 4 and pi. So I know already that S over 2 is going to be in the second quadrant. That means sine is positive, cosine and tangent will both be negative. All right. Important for when we use those half angle identities and we're picking the sign. Let's start with, that one starts with cosine, but let's start with sine. Let's say I want to find sine of S over 2. I know that it's positive, so I'm going to use the positive square root. The square root of 1 minus cosine of S, all divided by 2. And we're given cosine of S. We are told cosine of S is 2 thirds, so I'm just going to plug it in in this case. Right? So 1 minus 2 thirds divided by 2 all underneath that square root. I'll have 1 third divided by 2, which is 1 sixth. And this kind of already simplifies, but the square root of 1 sixth is, oops, there we go. Square root of 1 sixth is 1 over the square root of 6. Multiply the top and the bottom by the square root of 6 to rationalize it. 
So square root of six over six. Very, very, very similar for cosine of s over two. The only difference is the sign in the middle. Instead of one minus cosine of s, it's one plus cosine of s. So I'm gonna add two thirds. One plus two thirds over two is five thirds over two. That's the square root of five six. That's all underneath the square root. So square root of five sixths. And then again, that's the square root of five divided by the square root of six. So multiply the top and the bottom by the square root of six to rationalize it. The square root of five times the square root of six is the square root of 30. All right. This one is negative because cosine is negative in the second quadrant. We know that S over two is gonna be in the second quadrant. Okay. And then lastly, tangent of S over two. Easiest way is just to take the ones that we've already found. I know sine of S over two and cosine of S over two. So take the square root of six over six divided by the negative square root of 30 over six. The six is in the denominator. When I flip and multiply, those are gonna cancel out. I'm gonna have negative square root of six over square root of 30. If I rationalize that, multiply the top and the bottom by the square root of 30 to cancel out, I get a 30 in the denominator. Six times 30 is 180, so square root of 180 in the numerator. And then this, I can simplify a bit further. If I can find a perfect square that's a factor of 180, like say 36, 180 is 36 times five. So the square root of 36 times the square root of five is just six times the square root of five. So if this is six times the square root of five over 30, the sixes can cancel out. I just get negative square root of five over five. So I'm gonna factor that, I'm gonna simplify that square root on the top to make it a little bit easier. Uh, so it was six square root of five over 30. Yeah, this will be six square root of five over 30. Okay. And that gives me all the half angles again. And it makes sense that that's negative, obviously. I mean, we use the sine and the cosine there and only one of them had a negative sign but tangent's negative in the second quadrant, and we know S over two is in the second quadrant here. All right. Could have done this multiple ways. Again, we use this because we already found sine and cosine at that half angle. I could have used <coughs> any of those other uh, identities for tangent if I wanted to and plugged in from there. Questions on any of that so far? Makes sense. Right. Let's say I want to simplify then, just so we recognize what some of these identities look like in other forms and we can simplify from there. Simplify the following expressions. So I have plus or minus the square root of one plus cosine of 12x over two. I'm gonna recognize that that has the same form as the identity or the half angle identity then for which function. I know it's, I mean, by virtue of the fact that there is just a square root of a one plus or minus cosine of something over two, it's gotta be either sine or cosine of the half angle. Which one is it gonna be? It's going to be cosine. Why is it cosine? Because it's a plus in between. That's exactly right. Again, that's the only difference between the half angle identities for sine and cosine is that the sine in between, both of them use cosine of A, remember, but the sine in between, either plus or minus, is different. If it's plus, it's the cosine half angle identity. All right. So, I know that the a part 
of that half angle identity is 12x because I have 1 plus cosine of 12x over 2 inside that square root. So if a is 12x, that just means I have cosine of a over 2, so 12x over 2. That just means I have cosine of 6x. Right? So I can simplify that entire, like, that not really great looking expression with a square root and then a fraction and even a plus or minus. I can simplify all of that to just cosine of 6x. It means the same thing because of that half angle identity that we have. right second one possibly even a little easier one minus cosine of five alpha over sine of five alpha has the form for what half angle identity should be obvious because it's not the same as the other ones this one will be a half angle identity for tangent exactly right and since I, very, very important, I want to make sure to emphasize this part for this. In order for us to rewrite this <coughs> as a half angle identity for tangent, the angles inside of both the cosine and the sine here are going to have to be the same, all right? Just like they were for every other identity that we have, Pythagorean identities and all that kind of stuff, um, they have to be the same thing. So it has to be 5 alpha and 5 alpha, or 2 alpha and 2 alpha, or theta and theta, or x and x, whatever it is. Have to match up. But if they do, then that just means that the a part of tangent of a over 2 is 5 alpha. So I'm going to have tangent of 5 alpha over 2. Not much I can do to simplify that. I mean, 5 doesn't divide by 2 evenly, like 12 and 2 do. So I'm just going to leave it as tangent of five alpha over two or if you prefer tangent of five halves alpha if you want to write the the angle off to the side a little bit so how come this is the difference how come it's not sine of cosine because of the one minus how come it's not the tangent, one, tangent yeah this sine. one's this one's tangent because it's one minus cosine of a over sine of a I mean, that's the only, yeah. is this the only formula that holds that value like that or to, you know, it's the only one that we can rewrite as a, tan, a half angle for tangent. I mean, we could, well, I say it's the only one. If I had sine of 5 alpha over 1 plus cosine of 5 alpha, it'd be the same thing. It wouldn't be cotangent? No. Yeah, yeah. No, we only have them for the, the sine cosine tangent. Oh, we, okay. Yeah, we don't have any for where cotangent or secant or cosine. We need any of the other ones. We just use a, a reciprocal. After you get the final answer. Yeah. Okay. Right, that, well, now that you say that, that's probably a good thing to mention. Make sure this matches up if, if we're going to rewrite something like this. So make sure this is 1 minus cosine of 5 alpha on the top over sine of 5 alpha. That's the, the form for tangent. If this was... If this was reversed, this was sine of 5 alpha over 1 minus cosine of 5 alpha, that's not, that's not the exact identity for tangent. Because the exact identity for tangent would be sine of 5 alpha over 1 plus cosine of 5 alpha. So if I have the reciprocal of this, really all I do is write it as 1 over this part and then say 1 over tangent of 5 alpha over 2, which would be cotangent. So yeah, be very careful with those signs and make sure it matches up with the identities that we have. But generally, I don't think anything's going to try to trick you that much. I definitely won't on a test. That seems a little excessive. All right. Questions on any of that? One more thing then. Let's verify an identity, sine of x over 2 plus cosine of x over 2, the quantity squared, equal to 1 plus sine of x.
I'm going to verify this identity. Almost certainly the side that I want to work with is the left hand side because that's way more complicated. Not a whole lot I can do with one plus sine of X by itself. So the first thing I'm going to do on that left hand side is actually multiply it out. I'm going to take sine of X over two plus cosine of X over two times sine of X over two plus cosine of X over two. I'm going to square it. I make sure as always square something that has a plus or a minus in between. We don't just square each term. I actually multiply each term out. All right. So foil it out. I'm going to have sine of X over two times sine of X over two gives me sine squared of X over two. I'm going to have plus sine of X over two cosine of X over two and then plus sine of x over 2, cosine of x over 2 again. So that's the 2 sine of x over 2, cosine of x over 2. And then plus cosine of x over 2 times itself, so cosine squared of x over 2. Wait, so when you're doing the, the full technique, and it's like, you got sine, cosine, and then on the, so on, on the outside, when you're sine, cosine, on the, on the inside, it's cosine, sine. They're still, they're still the same property, right? No matter if yeah, it's sine. Yeah, still the same Right. Still trying to simplify this to that right hand side. I can recognize here that I have at, at least one obvious identity to start with, and there is another identity there. But if I group them together a little bit differently, if I take the sine squared of x over 2 plus cosine squared of x over 2, right, that is Pythagorean identity. Remember, sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta is equal to one. Doesn't matter what theta is, what the angle is, as long as it's the same. It has to be the same angle, in this case, x over two. But sine squared of x over two plus cosine squared of x over two is going to equal one. All right, and then I can also look at the second part and hopefully recognize that that can be rewritten as an identity as well. All right, don't get necessarily thrown by you know, the X over two there. Two sine theta, cosine theta is the double angle identity for sine of theta, right? So I can rewrite two sine theta, cosine theta as sine of two theta. In this case, that theta value, that angle is X over two. So two sine X over two, cosine of X over two is sine of two times x over two. All right, and then again, that first part in parentheses is equal to one, it's Pythagorean identity. So I just have one plus sine of two times x over two, and two times x over two is just x. So that gives me the right-hand side, the one plus sine of x that we were looking for. All right. Makes sense. Any questions there? Technically, we didn't use a half angle identity there. We used a double angle identity. Good deal. All right. Go back through. Make sure we remember these. All right. The forms of the half angle identity so that, especially so that we can find those exact values, but also in case we need to use them for verifying identities and things like that. All right. Any questions? I ended a little bit early today. I got a question about like the little previous homework. That was um, on the homework. Yeah, well, it was okay. So I'm not sure which one it was, but you know, like when you're when they give you a, a degree value. So why, and, and some of them were like 120 minus 45, you know, so what, why would you, why would you want to go into the second, second quadrant with an angle instead of, if you could, if you could pull it out of the first quadrant, like two pi over three or negative, okay, so pi over four minus two pi over three. So I guess that's a 30, a 30 degree angle and a 120 degree angle. So that was a 90, so let's say it was like sine of 90. Okay. You know, and they and they give you the options of uh, well, that's not it. But 
what, what it was doing it was putting me off into the second quadrant mm -hmm. instead of keeping me in the first quadrant where the values are all positive and all simplified you know and then but when i went and did some watch some videos to try to help me find different ways it was it was it was giving me the first quadrant well i mean if we're using something like like the second quadrant we're going to go off we're still reflecting off the x axis right so the one point, yeah. 120 degrees is going to be a 60 degree angle so you're saying something like sine of what we could use like 45 minus 120. yeah it was uh the other yeah just as an example okay yeah. so you're wondering why you use these specifically so this is going to end up as if we thought about this we're not using the if we aren't going to use the difference identity which probably we'll do that just in case but if we weren't using the difference identity uh this would just be sine of what uh, 75 so yeah sine of negative 75 degrees which is in the fourth quadrant. It's the same also if we needed to rewrite as negative sine of 75 degrees. But this right here is in quadrant four. Okay. So I already know, we know that much. But if I'm using the difference identity, so sine of 45 degrees, Cosine of 120 degrees minus cosine 45 sine of 120. So you're wondering why we just use like the first quadrant and the second quadrant for those? No, I mean, so I think the actual question was the sine of positive 75. Okay. And so they were giving me 120 minus the 45. You know, so why wouldn't you just use the 30, 45? And stay in the first quadrant. I mean, is there is it, is, it, is that just a different way to do it? Well, why wouldn't you use thirty and forty-five? Thirty plus forty-five, you still get seventy-five. Oh yeah, no, you could do that. Okay. Yeah, if you were writing it, wouldn't that be simpler? I mean, yes. If if you had, you know, if you had sine of one hundred and twenty minus forty-five degrees, you could definitely write that as sine of 45 degrees plus 30 degrees instead of using 120 there and, and doing that you, you'd still have a obviously you'd still have a sum identity but those those angles would be slightly easier to deal with than you know the 120 degrees okay. yeah you could use that it, it'd still give you the same answer okay you just have to remember the yeah so on the, on the 120 side it would probably be the negative but that would be the uh, positive value. Yes. So 120 would be the positive value of the y. Positive for sine and negative for the cosine. Yeah. Right. yeah, so so like when you're doing so this one would be sine, cosine. Yeah, yeah minus mean, sine, cosine. If we wrote this out, this would be sine of 120, cosine 45 minus cosine 120 sine of 45. So now you'd have to make sure that you get the values right. This one would be sine 45 cosine 30 plus cosine 45 and sine 30. Yeah, so the, the one you're doing now you wouldn't have to you wouldn't have to worry about making sure the positive and negatives are right on this yeah one, you, you wouldn't would. have to i mean these are all going to be positive okay. values the only the only one over here that's going to be negative is this one okay which makes sense if this is a negative value and i'm subtracting it i'm going to end up with a positive value okay. okay but yeah you should get the exact same answer for each of those all right uh, so you're going to put a review up today, or is it already worth it? Uh, I will, I'll, I'll try to put it up today. I'll put up homework today over this stuff. 
and then when I get a chance, either today or tomorrow, I'll put up a review for the test. And then on Wednesday, we'll review and we'll go over any questions you have over anything from chapters four and five. And then Friday would be the test. But I'll, I'll post it before Wednesday's class for sure.